Hi everyone. Uh, a week or so ago we went uh, at the beginning of our trail, the trail we have here at Northwind. This is a nice loop, goes around Steve's Pyramid, his freestanding pyramid that he built in 20, I think it was 2001 when this used to be our stock beds for production. We started the garden in 2001 and I started planting it in 2002 just on this half. So we're going to cover the second half of the loop. And this was actually on my right was the gravel garden I first put in in 2008, I believe. I, I visited with Cassie and Schmidt in um, Weinheim, Germany, and he showed me these beautiful gravel gardens that he did. And the simplicity of the gravel garden, it's changed his habitat. It's five inches of quartzite chips or chipped stone. We just did one using chipped pea gravel. It had edges, chipped edges on it. And the five inches changes the dynamics for weeds not to come through it and weeds can't live in it because it dries out too quickly. And the details are in my book, so if you get my book, you can read the details. And Cassian had these beautiful gardens. So I tried one here, and this is the gravel garden. Close to the pyramid, we have, I have the five inches of quartzite chips, haven't weeded yet. So that's 2008 or 2009, so that's 12 years. Now, when the gravel was reduced to two inches to match the edging here at the walk, weeds came through at the third year. So it was shallow enough, light could penetrate the gravel and cause the weed seeds to germinate, and the weeds came through at the third year. So the five inches is very important. So anyway, I don't do anything here. I let the dynamics of the plants respond to the gravel, and it's really turned into something special. The Calmagrasis brachytrichus seeded in. I thought, oh, that looks okay. The ironweed, Vernonia missouriensis, seeded in. The puticandum moved in on its own. And then the dynamics of Aster azureus, which is now the genus and species has changed, and I have to learn that. And it's okay, I'm 68, I got 20 more years, 30 more years to figure this out, so I can learn a new genus. And it's actually living in the gravel, seeding within the gravel, and the matrix grass that has stabilized everything is Sporobolus heterolepis. And you can see, you'll see that in the back in bloom. And Echinacea purpurea has crossed with Echinacea tennesseensis. And this is my Panicum northwind. So I collect seed out of this and I do it from seed and I just call it Panicum northwind. But you can see with the Echinacea tennesseensis parentage, it's still in bloom. It's September 5th. And this has been in bloom since early July. So I really like uh, Echinacea Northwind. Again, I can't sell it in a pot. I couldn't give it away. It's too big and leans too much. And when people pick it up and buy it, they just see a plant that they believe is unkept. So I use it a lot in my projects. So this is the Echinacea Northwind. Penstemon digitalis has seeded in. So it's quite a dynamic operation here. And the cool thing is on the pyramid, Look at Nepeta racemosa is climbing the stones of the pyramid. As it gets higher, it seeds into the pyramid and lives within the soil that it creates on its own going up the pyramid. I didn't do any of that. That all happens dynamically. So this is a cool area to, for me to watch and then share with people the opportunities of the gravel garden in multiple situations everywhere, like parking islands, all the parking islands we have that could be these beautiful gravel gardens. So on this side, we have Dyschampsia goldtow in this beautiful cloud of bloom right now. The Lobelia syphilitica I placed in the back and the Lobelia syphilitica is now seated in along the edge and I'm okay with that too. In fact, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm pretty okay with most things that happen here in the garden. I, I do look for, uh, I call them ketchup stains, something that's a distraction. So if something becomes a distraction, I'll take it out. But the dynamics are very beautiful. Susha pretensis is in the back, those beautiful blue flowers. And that's mixed with Amsonia tabernae montana salicifolia. That gives it structure in the spring. And the susha looks like little blue marbles floating in the back with the persistence of Persicaria and Plexicolis rosea. So that Persicaria just is persistent, blooming probably late July all the way into October. It'll still be in bloom, rosia. So we'll walk, walk a little farther down. And this area I've been struggling with. 
I have not had good success in here. I put uh, geranium uh, pretense, it's Victor, it has copper foliage, and that has done pretty well. But in my, my background, the shade has gotten too much for the baptisias. My ground layer of sedges has died off. I think I got too dry this year and I didn't water them. I put new ones in. So I've been neglectful here. Now I've got to work on improving this this year. So we'll be gardening this up probably in a week or two. And in the back, I had Carl Forrester, which takes a tremendous amount of shade, and Saladeco Cecia, which is, I allow seeding in the back. So that back kind of becomes its own, its own garden in its own way. The Carl Forrester just gives me some height and structure in the spring. And as we move into more sun, a different kind of dynamics happens here. This is Salinum officinalis. Salinum officinalis, I created my own nightmare with this. I put this in its beautiful white humble flowers. It looks like a, a short Queen Anne's lace. So I had planted that in drifts through here probably eight or nine years ago, seeded everywhere. So I'm battling it now. Before it drops its seed, we'll have this pruned out this, this week sometime, maybe tomorrow. So I gotta prune all this off, but it was covering the whole area through here and it was my doing. I, I put this in because I enjoyed the white umbels in spring and had nice texture, seeded everywhere. So eventually we're working it out. And in the back I put Millennia Heidenbrot, an enemy honorine Jobert with Carl Forrester and some groups of flocks that were uh, self, they self seeded with small flowers in another garden. And I moved them all out here because they had nice foliage, but they had t tiny small flowers. So I thought, well, I'll do a tiny small flower flocks area with the Carl Forrester in the back. And as we move through it, there's Aruncus Horatio, a group of Aruncus Horatio, which is very structurally sound. And I mix Echinaceas with more flocks back here. And these were flocks, again, that kept reseeding. And I just want to see what they do. With the, you can see the dark pink and the white with the dark pink. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to do more. Uh, I'm going to be a little better referee of the plantings as I move in this direction. That's kind of see how things work out. And as a backdrop, I put in Panicum Northwind and Aster Umbilatus, a tall flat-topped aster, to give me some height in the back for fall. And as we move through here, I put in Geranium Wallaceana ovum as a ground layer. So this starts grouping. I have a grouping of Stachys officinalis humulo grouping, and that goes into a group of Millennia Paul Peterson. And here's another cool thing. I love my screw-ups, and I don't mind sharing them with you because who doesn't, who doesn't know what they don't know? Now I know what I know. Aster sigillifloris, that's a native aster with tiny white flowers. I put that in our woodland area, and I don't know how it got here, but you can see the Aster sigillifloris with the uh, bottle gentian, gentiana andrusii. That's seeded everywhere, too. So between the salinum and the Aster sigillifloris, I created my own intense labor. So I'm holding here a foxtail. This is really the only uh, plant that I hadn't didn't put in. And they come up through, through everything because they have narrow foliage and they, have the, and they can collect sunlight energy. So they're, they can be pretty persistent. And I try to get these out because they reflect light so beautifully. And because they beautifully reflect light, they're easy to see and they become a distraction in the garden. So you can see there's some fox hills over here and some over here. Again, there's not, not much. We don't do much weeding right now except for the foxtail. And I find Aster sigillifloris. I pull that out as much as I can. And to be honest, we haven't, we haven't been in this garden for probably three weeks, maybe four, because our crew, we only have five people, and we take care of 43,000 square feet of gardens outside of Northwind. So we're, we're a gardening-driven group but I still have to remember caring for our North, North Wind Gardens. And uh, I think next week we'll run through here and we have to focus on Salinum and Aster Sigillifloris before they seed. It's important to get uh, the aggressive seeding plants out before they seed.
That's very critical to uh, keeping the garden uh, healthy. So let's look a little ahead here. Move into a group of Aster Twilight. Aster Twilight's uh, cross between Aster Macrophylla and I think Aster, uh, it's an Eastern one. I can't remember which one. I'll let you know on a future one, but it's Aster Twilight, actually. It's a hybrid. And Twilight's very minimal, if not seed, doesn't really seed much at all. So I don't have any trouble with this being too competitive in the garden. And I mix it with uh, Geranium Max Fry and a few Geranium Tiny Monster. The Max Fry is at the edge of the garden, then a couple of Tiny Monster in the back, and a beautiful yellow that I drifted through two years ago was Sylphium Mori. And again, this is a laboratory for me. I need to see the competitive nature and the forgiving nature of plants as they collide with each other. And then I can take the things I've learned and understood about their relationships out into public space or, or private space. I just did a garden in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and Calder sent me some pictures. The area was real wet and the salvias didn't do well. But I noticed the Eupatorium was very tall and the Aster Lateriflorus was very tall, lady in black. So what we need to do now, when we look at the growth rate of the plants when they're young, we need to prune those and keep those shorter so that as the plants mature with them, it, it looks more consistent, the growth rate does. And that way the owners don't see a giant plant of, Eup of Eupatorium next to a, a, short, a shorter plant. It looks out of scale. So those are some of the gardening things we have to look at as we establish the plants is spring pruning, keeping the plants shorter in scale as they grow together. Um, and I learned that here in this garden. This was my education of combining plants together. So I have another group of Stachys Umalo, and then it picks up with Coreopsis verticillata golden showers in four repetitive groups through the garden. And then about seven years ago, I introduced Gentiana andrusi, I bottle gentian. So I've got a group over here. I've got a group here. And, and I have more groups as we move ahead mixed with Sporobolus heterolepa. So the bottle gentian is a very soft, wonderful blue in this time of year in late August, September. And in, in with that too, you'll see some peonies. I got about four large groups of peonies drifting through the garden uh, for spring. And I have uh, Ranunculus arcus. I think that's how it's pronounced, A-C-R-I-S. A double flowered one I got from Brent Horvath at Intrinsic. So the yellow just floats along the edge here. And we can take a look at that next year as we walk through the garden every couple weeks and see how change occurs in the dynamics of the planting. So this is where the bottle gentian is picked up with, you can see the Sprobolus heterolepis. And the geranium is geranium sobeliferum. I mixed geranium sobeliferum. I went from tiny monster to sobeliferum. And then Coreopsis zagreb. So I went from Coreopsis grandiflora, which is a lot of grandiflora, to a shorter Coreopsis zagreb. And there's one, two groups. There's another group over there, two groups here. And then the Sprobolus is mingled with the geranium sobeliferum through here, all the way to the uh, Aster novi angeli. And that's one called Chicago I got from Brent. It's a beautiful aster, blooms earlier. And actually it's, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not novi angeli, it's Aster longifolius. I got that from Brent. And we'll pick it up over across the pathway here. And the Calamagrasis brachytrica, that just seeded in and I left it. And now it has a harder time to reseed because the plantings are so dense. When you put Calamagrasis brachytrica in very early, seeds everywhere. Comes up in everything. So if you're going to use this plant, I'd wait till your garden is mature to take away the opportunity of the plant seeding and becoming a nuisance. And again, this occurred without me putting it in. I kind of like it bubbling up at the end here, so I'm, I'm okay with that. And you see the aster crossing over the path here. That's Aster Chicago from Brent Horvath at Intrinsic Gardens. It's a beautiful plant. And it's with Sedum Pillow Talk 
also from Brent at Intrinsic. And this is a Colony Tiny Tortuga. It's Colony, I think, Oblica or Lione, and it's much shorter than the species. Still colonizes. And the sedge I have in here is Carex remota. And I, I used to have Cesslary here, but the frequency of spring rains we've had in the last six years has weakened the Cesslaria, it just gets too wet. So the Carex remota plays a nice role of going from average to moist soil. And it's a good support for this, this particular planting I have. And there's the Sylphia mori. It's such a, it's, it's beautifully lazy, isn't it? I just like the way it leans and lays. And then it has that nice soft yellow that's easily appreciated. And back there's a Phlox Blue Paradise still in bloom. So you got that moment of blue with the yellow and a white Phlox, uh, I can't remember the name. It was perennial plant of the year, I believe. And that, that's in the back backdrop. So as we move, we'll take a few more brief steps this way. There's more Persicaria rosea and Sedum carl. It's a shorter sedum. And Sedum pillow talk and Sedum carl seem to have done well in moist soil. So I, I really use Carl and Pillow Talk and Neon. They, they, three of them seem to do pretty good in heavier soils that might get too wet for a moment. And the more Colony Oblica, the tiny Tortuga. And that's it, and then we're on our way out. And again, I just put Deschampsia through here. I have Deschampsia as we move through. And the dynamics of Ruelia. Ruelia I planted probably eight or nine years ago, and that has found its way into many different areas of the garden. So thanks for your patience in taking this walk with me, and uh, we'll talk next time and look at some more plantings. Have fun, everyone.